process. The big thing most people, most students get confused on is just not following AdPi. Make sure you assess, 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 assess before anything else. Unless that patient's going to die in the next two minutes, you must assess. And this is actually an example from our Picmonic learning system. So if you're not preparing for the NCLEX right now and you're still in school, um, this is just an example of how we take um, an assessment. Here's for number two, and we turn it into the assess man, so you can always remember to assess first. So remember add pi, we're actually going to show you an add plus sign with a pi. So you can always remember that along with his RN assessor. So you can remember assessment, diagnosis, planning. Now everything when you do planning, this is more for your clinical evaluations. You know all those plans, all those, all those goals you have to write on those disastrous care plans, which I hate and I'm sure you do too. Um, that they've got to be realistic, individualized, and timed. If he doesn't have each of those three pieces, you're a clinical instructor, especially if you had some really evil ones like mine, they're going to throw it back at you and tell you to do it again, and you're just going to hate your life. And I don't want that for you today, and you don't want it either, and that's no fun. So the last thing is implementation and evaluation for the nursing process. And that's really important to make sure you evaluate um, all of your interventions to make sure that they are actually, uh, actually work. Now the next thing, um, is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, before I say anything, um, we do have lots and lots of um, high yield uh, questions that I like to ask, and you can always type in the answers into your little question box. Um, today, because I have so many things I want to go over, I'm definitely not going to hit on all of my questions like I would normally do, but uh, you know, I'm going to go over a lot of them for sure. But the big thing is Maslow's. So I don't think I have my Maslow's Picmonic here in my, no I don't. I don't have my Maslow's Picmonic in our system here. But what you need to know is ABCs, right? ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. Always, 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 if there's a question and you see patent airway, the answer is something to do with airway, right? And if there's no airway and there's no breathing um, and there's no circulation, there's no excessive bleeding, then you worry about kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it's a way of thinking. So if you've not, if you're planning right now for, um, for NCLEX and you've really not mastered that, it really comes down to answering questions and knowing what's going to kill the patient first. Um, that's really what we worry about. Now the next thing is normal vital signs. Um, so we just want to talk on some normal vital signs. Uh, you know, these are pretty, by this point, everyone should know all of the normal vital signs. So what's a normal pulse? 60 to 100, right? So if the pulse is high, then we need to speed it up. If it's low, I mean, sorry, if it's, if it's high, we need to slow it down. If it's low, we need to speed it up. Now, what kind of a patient normally is going to have a low pulse rate below 60 and that it's normal for them? What kind of patient? Does anybody know? Anybody know? That's right. So we have athletes. Athletes, that's a big one. So somebody who's a big athlete or, you know, a, tr a trainer, a long-term trainer, um, they often have really low pulse rates. And that's really important, uh, very high yield thing that you need to know that's probably uh, likely to show up on the NCLEX to try to confuse you. Um, and that's really, really important. Make sure you know that. And uh, Maria says another patient who's a pacemaker. Um, and that's possible, but, um, you know, that shouldn't be your first thing. The first thing you should think about somebody who is very physically fit um, and very, uh, very physically fit and, uh, um, you know, very good shape, works out, um, maybe like a distance runner, usually an athlete type person going to have a low pulse rate. Uh, another thing I want to talk about, um, aside from just your assessment of your normal vital signs, is to really talk about your, uh, you know, the neurovascular assessment. Uh, so the six P's. Now you're not going to get questioned on the six P's, but it's really important that you understand each one. Um, so we, you know, we worry about neurovascular assessments. So maybe a patient who is um, uh, unable, maybe they have a. You're assessing their their uh, limb after a hip surgery, or if they're in a cast. Right. This is going to involve a neurovascular assessment. So if I'm here. In a, in a hand cast, I want to assess everything about this hand. So I'm going to look for pain. We've got our P pain bolts here. I'm going to worry about paresthesias. So paresthesias, and we show everything here as our pins and needles character, but we actually help you remember it by this P Paris t-shirt for paresthesias. And that's just a pins and needles type feeling. Another P in uh, neurovascular system is pulse. So make sure you feel the pulse in my cast of the hand um, so you can feel a good pulse. Uh, also is power. So you want to feel um, you know, look at, assess the the, uh, the limb, 
and see if it's gray, if it's red, if it's pink, if it's gone. You know, those type, type of things are really, really important. Um, another one is pressure to see what the, the pressure of the actual skin is like. Um, is there increased pressure inside the tissue like edema? Um, and also is paralysis. So if I'm in a cast up to my hand here and I say, oh, I'm, you know, do you feel any fit, pain in your fingers? Can you wiggle your fingers? No, they're not paralyzed. I'm going to assess a pulse. Um, all those things are really, really important. And those are assessment findings that are absolutely important for you uh, to know. Now, another, uh, just, <clears throat> I kind of feel like we're going out of order, but uh, it's definitely a, a logical pr progression to go through assessment type things, as always, and you know everything you think, you always should think assess first. Uh, but another assessment uh, type thing is really just um, being able to assess pain. Um, so remember that pain, uh, pain isn't going to kill you, um, contrary to popular belief. But uh, pain is a subjective thing, so you must always ask the patient to rate their pain on a, uh, on a, on a scale so that way you know. You can never say, well, the pain is bad. Um, everyone's definition of bad is different. So you need to make sure you have an, you know, a scale, zero, one to ten. And I actually like to use the example. I always use this example when I worked in the, worked EMS um, as a paramedic. I would say, well, let's say zero is no pain, and let's say ten is being burned alive. So what would you say your pain is? And, you know, I'd always get a 10. And then I would ask him, I'd be like, really? You feel like you're being burned alive right now? Um, and usually, uh, if it was true, they'd be, yes, I really feel like that. And then you know that it's a really severe pain, um, so that way you kind of always know. Now, another thing that's important um, and is a fundamental concept, but also um, a little bit of psych or whatnot, but, you know, child and elder abuse. So what are some signs and symptoms of uh, child or elder abuse. Does anybody know? Have any examples of those? Child and elder abuse. These are really high yield things to look for. And everyone says bruises. And, and I can tell you right now that, you know, uh, elderly people very often, they bruise very easy. They have very thin skin and they're often on things like clopidogrel, clipid like Plavix, so they bruise very easy. And that's what we, you know, that's normal. I can tell you that, um, you know, I grew up um, in southern Ohio and was born in West Virginia, so we ran around like, you know, crazy people outside all the time and we would always get bruised as kids. Um, so, you know, what kind of things? Oh, now I see some better answers. So the big thing is um, bruises of different stages. That's really important. So several bruises of different stages, um, in, especially in children um, or an adult. That's the same. Um, and we have um, broken bones. But broken bones are okay. But again, multiple stages of broken bones. Again, very, very bad. So we see a new broken bone, but we also see previous or a history of several broken bones. That's not a good sign. Um, Virginia actually states some um, really good one, especially with uh, especially with the elderly and its fear of the caregiver. And that's actually probably one of the biggest ones. Is um, you're going to get some type of scenario where um, your patient, you go to interview the patient, and um, the patient's you know not doesn't make good eye contact. They don't look at you, and they don't really say anything. And the caregiver speaks for them. Um, so what do you do there? Well, what you want to do is try to speak to that patient alone. Um, that's a really, a really big thing um, right away. Malnourishment is another good one um, that I see. It's, it's possible, but definitely not by itself alone. You want to correlate along. Um, and uh, another one is, um, let's see here. I'm just reading a couple of these. Oh, so... Um, uh, being being fearful of talking around um, your caregiver or you know whoever's taking care of you that's for sure um, and looks like that's looks like you guys I'm just reading all your answers here to make sure that I've got them yeah and then uh, really the other one is just inconsistencies in the story so you know they tell you that they fell down and um, then um, you know really they're just covered in bruises all over. So the story just doesn't match up with what they're saying. And that's another clue. Just remember that um, any kind of child abuse or elder abuse is report is a reportable incident and must be reported to the authorities. And that's really important to do that. So we have picmonics on each one of these individual, uh, individual topics and uh, as well. So just so you know. 
So oxygen oxygen delivery uh, oxygen delivery methods, which is is actually really really important. But I don't need to go over it because I think it really is just kind of understood. Um, and you're not going to get any specific type questions that are really going to throw you off with this. Uh, but the the one thing that is is true is about the Venturi, uh, the Venturi mask. What's really important about the Venturi mask versus every other oxygen delivery device? And that's the one thing that is really, really important that you absolutely must know uh, why it's different. So what is different about the Venturi mask? Oh, Liz got it right away before anybody else, I feel like, had even a, question, a chance to get an answer. But I'm not going to give the answer yet, Liz. That's right. Oh, so... Um, um, so, uh, the big thing is it, it's the only device that can deliver an accurate um, amount of oxygen at, uh, at the mouth, um, at the actual, you know, or at the, uh, the nose. So it's the only one that can deliver the most accurate percentage um, right at the device. Um, all of the rest of them, keep in mind, if I put you on two liters via nasal cannula and I put you on a hundred feet of nasal cannula tubing, are you getting two liters at your little nostrils? You're not uh, because that decreases and that's really, really important because the control valve is right there on the Venturi mask and that's really, really important. Um, so make sure you know that, that that's the only device that can really give you um, actual, you know, precise uh, precise measurements. Now, the next thing is a really more of a concept rather than a basic, and it's hypoxia. So this is really important um, hypoxia that you really be able to just identify what kind of signs and symptoms are hypoxia. Well, what's hypoxia? Well, it's decreased oxygenation, right? Um, you know, it's inability uh, for oxygen to be delivered to the tissues, either because you're not oxygenating well, um, you know, usually type of a thing. So early signs, um, you know, cyanosis, peripheral cyanosis, everything tries to shunt to the center of the body. So I can have finger cyanosis, or if you're somebody like me and you have Raynaud's phenomenon, um, you know, you get cyanosis of your fingers all the time. But um, there's, you know, the early signs. So that's, you know, early cyanosis, shunting of the blood to the, the systemic circulation. But late signs, late signs and symptoms are really important to know, and that's really knowing that you have a central uh, cyanosis. And Liz really pointed out a good point. Also, is early on, um, early signs, you're going to see tachycardia, and that's a compensation mechanism. Now, it, what's another uh, compensation mechanism where you see tachycardia? Well, that's shock. Any type of shock, maybe you had a hypovolemia, well, the first thing that's going to compensate is tachycardia because we increase the beats, um, the heart rate increases to increase the heart rate so that you can keep cardiac output up. And that's exactly where you, why we see hypoxia because it's exactly the same thing and it all goes along with it. Um, and lots of you guys are typing lots of things and uh, confusion and disorientation and restlessness are all definite signs of hypoxia. And that's a really important one. Um, we have really, really, really great, um, really great uh, picmonics. So you can go in and see each of these details in the right way. But the big thing is to remember um, it starts at the peripheral and it moves to the internal, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, central, the trunk, you know, trunk uh, cyanosis. Now, another thing. Um, that's a really basic fundamental thing is just to really understand some basics on diet um, and diet and um, really being able to uh, progress diets for patients. So a patient has dysphagia. What kind of diet do they immediately go on? Anybody know? A patient has dysphagia. What kind of diet do they immediately go on? I don't know. I think they go on the marshmallow and cheese diet. I think that one sounds good. I just made it up. Sounds good to me, right? I would like to have a diet of marshmallow and cheese. Sure. So the big thing is to really understand. Yeah, so I see lots and lots and lots of different, uh, different answers here. And the big one, uh, what's important, anytime somebody has dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, immediately you're not going to feed them anymore. You can't just immediately put them on... Uh, thickened liquids, which is what everyone picked, or puree, everyone picked that, right? But you are not the person who is able to assess their level of swallowing, and that's what's really important here. Who is? What type of patient is available, or what kind of pr uh, provider is going to do that? Well, that's a speech therapist. Um, that's what's really important, a speech therapist. So the patient is MPO until speech therapy uh, can 
uh, can assess them. And um, what kind of diet are they likely to be put on? Well, they're likely to be put on a thickened liquid diet. Um, and that's really, really, that's really the second step there is a thickened liquid diet. That's what you have to know for it. It's really important. So types of diets, um, you know, you can be on a liquid diet. You can be on a puree diet, um, thickened liquids here we have. Uh, we can be on a mechanical soft diet, a low fiber diet, and then a regular diet. So really we just have kind of our progression here. We have each one of these inside of our Picmonic so you can really understand each one and all the details that go along with it if you're not 100% um, up to speed on that as well. So section two, um, really quick, I just want to talk about some skills. We're going to talk about some skill things um, that are definitely, um, definitely, definitely, definitely important for um, fundamental type concepts. Uh, we're going to talk about tracheostomy care. Now, um, and um, tracheostomy, ileostomy, colostomy, really quick. So uh, tracheostomy care, what's really important here? Well, the important thing, there's just a couple of really important points. Um, if you have a tracheostomy, it is really, really important to know what. What's really important with a tracheostomy care? The patient has a trach, they come back, they've got it there. Probably the biggest thing, you know, there's, there's a lot, several little things, but number one, if they just had it placed, well, you can't replace it. But what is important, uh, or you can't change it, uh, what is important if it gets dislodged, you must always have a tube nearby. You need to have a replacement tube nearby. Now, if it's new, what's really important about it? Well, if you just have this hole placed, um, what's important, of course, is the fact that you need to have a, uh, a new one put in but that new one's not going to fit in that same place because of all of what? Well, because of swelling. Um, that's why. So you need to have a smaller size, right? A smaller size available. And you can put that smaller size in. Um, you can replace that smaller size if it comes dislodged right away. Now, the, if the patient has an old colostomy, uh, what's really important is you would always um, tracheostomy care. You're going to clean around the stoma every eight hours. Um, and also, every time you put that you know, that tie on, what's really important with any kind of tie? Well, we don't want to make sure it's too tight, but most importantly, we want to make sure we get two fingers underneath that tie because we make sure we're not choking those poor patients to death, and that's really important. Now, ileostomy. So we have ileostomy and colostomy. Well, these are, you know, we have our eel star mouth and our colon star mouth here, and we have picmonics for each individual one of these. But what's important to know? Well, the big thing here is to understand digestion and elimination concepts and the fact that when it, uh, ileostomy is a, is a stoma in the ileum and a colostomy is a stoma in the, in the colon. So we know that if we have our little question mark, oops, I went too far here. So we have our little question mark of a, uh, colon, you know, of a colon and we have our ileum in the middle of there, we know that our ileum is more likely to be liquefied stool because as it progresses from the uh, duodenum or duodenum, down um, to the ileum, terminal ileum, and to the colon. It becomes liquid, um, then it becomes, you know, it's this liquid chyme, then it becomes a little more solid, a little more solid, a little more solid. So it goes to the colon. It's colon essentially just draws fluid out of it to make this wonderful, beautiful little st stool pooplet that you're just going to poop out, right? But if you have an ileostomy, um, what kind of output are you going to expect from that? Well, you're going to expect some liquid liquidy, gross sickness coming out of that. Um, but a colostomy, well, you're going to expect probably very similar to formed stool coming out of a colostomy. Now, what's important for diet for these? Well, the big thing is a uh, ileostomy is you want to make sure they're on a low fiber diet, low fiber diet, because you don't want to create a bunch of bulk for them. And a colostomy, you want to put them on a high fiber diet. And those are really important points to make sure you know. And they're inside of both of these picmonics if you want to go back and review them, but they're really, really important for you to know. Um, so moving on um, to lung sounds. Now, lung sounds are something that is just crazy, crazy, crazy difficult for so many students to memorize. You're probably going to hear lung sounds. Um, you know, there's a, a high likelihood you're going to hear lung sounds on your exam. My mouth's getting dry here today. But it's high likelihood you're actually going to get some lung sounds on your exam. You may have to listen to and auscultate and hear the lung sounds. Now, a couple of them are pretty easy right away. Now, if you're getting described lung sounds, those are pretty difficult, I think, harder in my opinion. But what I want you to remember is um, crackles. So there's coarse and fine crackles. 
So here, are, here's actually these are actually our pigmonics for lung sounds. So we on the left hand side of your screen here, we have our um, our fine crackles. And I want you to just take some of your hair right here near your beautiful little ears. I'm sure all oh, well, you guys have beautiful little ears. I just want you to rub it back and forth. And it just kind of, you know, feels a little weird. But it's right beside your ear and you hear it, right? That's what fine crackles sound like. So somebody takes a big deep breath and you can hear this, you know, rubbing sound, um, kind of like ears, then you know that's a fine crackle. Now, take some Velcro and tear Velcro apart here on the right-hand side. That's a coarse crackle. That's definitely more of a severe crackle. Um, but how do I keep that separate from ronchi? Now, ronchi, I always explain this the same way. And I don't know if I could do it because my, my, uh, my water is here really full. But I can pretty much explain it as it's pretty much um, when you hear fluid coming through a straw that's almost of an empty, uh, empty container. I got a lot of air with that, but that's ronchi. So what happens is that's air moving through mucus. It's just pouring through mucus. And we've got it here. It's all described here in our pigmonic. It's this low, rumbling-like sound, and it sounds a lot like sucking air through a straw from a very empty cup because um, it's this fluid moving through this pockets and pockets of mucus. Um, wheezing, uh, one of my favorite pigmonic characters are wheezing weasel, and that's really... Um, this high-pitched sound, high-pitched sound, um, which is uh, very classic, especially on expiration, expiratory wheezes. And really just kind of the other one of these two. Now, the last one I'm, I'm not able to really explain, but it's definitely 100% different than anything else, is a pleural friction rub. Now, a pleural friction rub. Now, we've got it right here in our picmonic, um, so you can remember here, our pleural friction rub. You can remember it right here. See this little um, balloon? It's almost exactly like you took this beautiful balloon and you just rubbed your fingers across it. You know, you rubbed your fingers across a dry balloon. What happens is the lungs are trying to expand, and um, inside the pleural cavity, there's usually some nice, beautiful fluid in there that allows um, those two to glide along each other. But what happens is it gets uh, either it's gone, uh, maybe they have uh, you know some kind of fibrotic lung, pulmonary fibrosis, whatnot, maybe they have a, um, uh, other issues, but it causes the lung to actually rub across that pleura and you actually it feels just like that very, very coarse <laughs> balloon type sound, um, and that's a pleural friction rub. You can always, always, always get that one. So simple. Um, but you're likely to get, um, probably, probably, probably likely to get um, um, Ronchi, wheezes, crackles. Um, they're pretty easy. Just listen to them a couple of times. You can always go on Google and get them. Um, and you'll see to be able to compare them to the examples that I've given you. Now, enemas. Enema, Emma here. We have our Enema, Emma character. And if you listen to this pigmonic, it's definitely one of my favorites. Because you can always have fun with Enema, Emma. Because we have an Enema, Enema, Emma pigmonic. And it's a wonderful doll character that everyone can have fun with learning about enemas. It's a lot of fun. Now, what's really, really, really high yield about some types of enemas? Now, there's types of enemas all inside our pigmonic. But the big thing is um, we want to worry about what kind of – which nerve stimulation if we're giving somebody an enema. Which – which one? What kind of – what nerve is that? That's right, guys. You all hit it, and that's right, vagal nerve. So if I stimulate the vagal nerve, it's very often I'm going to drop that patient's heart rate. Now, what are the kind of things to stimulate the vagus nerve? Well, carotid massage. Let me just go ahead and, you know, I always think about just if you choke somebody out, I'm going to choke myself out right here. I choke myself out, and I turn my face red. I'm actually putting pressure, and I'm stimulating the vagus nerve, and that's going to make me pass out because it's going to drop my heart rate. Um, and that's really, really important to know. So enema, enema here, you can get some stimulating of the vagus nerve, which could lower the heart rate. But what's really important, um, probably the most common question I see personally with enemas um, is that a patient experiences pain with their enema during administration. What does the nurse do first? What does the nurse do first? What's the very first thing you, you have if there's discomfort or pain while you're giving someone their lovely, lovely, lovely enema? Well, if there's discomfort, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to slow the flow. 
slow the flow. Well, how do you slow the flow? You price administering it too fast and then stop the enema. Second, first, slow the flow. And how do we slow the flow? Well, I mean, how hold we, how high we hold that bag depends on how fast it goes in. So if you know you want to give an enema something you don't really like, and you give them a, you know, 500 cc retention, I mean, you just hold that thing really high so that the, all the enema juice, all that enema juice, mm, enema juice goes in really fast, right? Um, but the big thing is you want to slow it down first by lowering it down. I um, mean, it's usually about 12 to 18 inches where you want to hold it, but you want to hold it above. If you're holding it above the 18 inches, is awfully you're going to give it too fast, and the patient's going to have a lot of discomfort. First thing you do is slow it down. Then, if they still experience discomfort, then you stop. Everyone always goes with stop, and you're always going to get that question wrong. Look for slow the flow. Look for lowering the bag, um, and then, and then, and then stop the enema. Nobody likes getting an enema. If there's anybody out there that likes getting an enema, they're weird. Okay? So any of you guys listening that like to get enemas, you're weird. Okay? And you, that's all I have to say about that. Now, I do have a patient story. But this little patient guy who used to come in the ER years ago, um, unfortunately he passed away. But I don't know, maybe he was lonely, I don't know. But he would always come to the ER with constipation. And what did he need to get? An enema. And I think he enjoyed it. Um, but one of the big things was just remember that if you give a nice slow flow enema, that it's nice and comfortable. But a high fast enema, you slow it down before you stop it. And that's a really, really high yield point. Because everyone misses that question. Don't miss that question. Um, next thing is um, some tests and procedures. And I'm not going to go over each one of these individually. I'm just going to hit some really high yield points um, on each one of these for sure. But the big thing is, um, you know, we have our MRI. Now, the very first thing about an MRI, you should immediately be screaming out, what, 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 what? What are we screaming out as soon as I say MRI? Before I even ask any question about MRI, what should you be saying? I mean, guys, this is this is a this is an easy one. You guys aren't getting it. I'm really I'm really disappointed. Okay, there we go. So the big thing is making sure that what is an MRI? Well, an MRI is a magnetic resonance imaging. So do you have any metal? Is there any metal in your body? Do you have a pacemaker? If you has a, have a pacemaker, is it is it MRI safe? If they don't know, it's not MRI safe. That is the answer. So. That is really, really important. Uh, making sure that they don't uh, don't have any type of metal, you know, body piercings, as Tracy says, and that's really, really important. Um, though that's the biggest thing with an MRI. Um, and then, of course, lay still. All that stuff I think is common sense. Same with CT. Lay still. Blah blah. blah. Uh, may you know, administer an anxiety medication if they're really nervous. That stuff's not usually important. You're usually going to get that metal question. Um, for sure. And they're always going to contrast MRI versus CT. Just remember the name of it, magnetic resonance imaging, and you're going to remember magnet metal. Uh, that's how I remember it. CT, different. CAT scan. Uh, so TB test. What's important about a TB test? So TB test is really, really important. Um, oh, Liz points out an MRI has some uh, medicine patches, and some medicine patches contain some types of uh, metallic materials, and that's really important sometimes to make sure those are taken off. But that's not a high yield question usually, uh, not not as far as I know yet. Maybe it's up and coming. I'm not sure. So TB test. What's really important about a TB test? How what is it? What indicates a positive TB test? Let's put it that way. Well, let me just go ahead and say this just for the sake of time. The TB test is a is an intradermal uh, uh, injection, so it's intraderma into the dermis, and it creates an induration. An induration is a little bump um, that you inject, and you get it read um, 48 to 72 hours later, and you're feeling for that induration. What's really, really important is you have to have an induration of 10 millimeters in a normal, healthy patient. In a patient who's immunocompromised or maybe a patient who's at high risk, um, you would accept 5 millimeters because they have a less of immune response. What you're doing is you're creating a type 4 or a sensitivity reaction in their body, which is a mounting response, which is creating these, th, um, these T cells to react to that and um, create this big giant induration. You've seen a positive TB test before. They're really, really large. Um, just another uh, kind of a low yield point as far as what I'm concerned, but uh, is if they've ever had the BCG vaccine, um, the TB vaccine, if they're not from the United States, maybe they come from India or, or a third world country, um, they probably have the BCG vaccine, and you're always going to test positive for a TB test, which means you need what kind of test to rule it out? 
chest x-ray, and that's right. Uh, lumbar puncture, we're always going to talk about that's between the fourth and fifth. Uh, vertebral space, um, lie on your side, lay on your back for an hour after the procedure. Uh, one to four hours after the procedure are also important. I'm not going to talk about pilogram or liver biopsy, but anytime we're giving um, IV contrast dye, just really quick, um, the only thing giving IV contrast dye is a couple important points with IV contrast dye that are fundamental concepts you must, 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 must know. And what are they? What do we need to know about IV contrast dye? What is that? Oh, think, 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 think. Yeah, everyone always says the iodine shellfish thing. Okay, let me tell you what. The likelihood you're going to get that question, not very likely. Everyone knows that. Everyone has that. Yes, 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 yes. But what's actually more important that you're probably going to get is the big thing is a patient with uh, making sure that they drink, drink, drink lots of fluids after, after they receive contrast dye because it's at a high risk to cause renal failure. And that's right, Clarissa got it, um, is the kidneys. We always worry about the kidneys. We need to get that contrast dye out of the system because it can cause severe um, kidney problems. So we want to also screen those patients for kidney types of issues anytime we have IV contrast dye. Yes, allergies to selfless, iodine, yes, it's true. Is it likely you're going to get that question? I don't think so. It's so high yield uh, or so common that everyone just burned that in their brain, I don't know. But um, that's likely what you're not going to get. Um, you're likely to get something else about it, like uh, making sure you hydrate efficiently afterwards uh, to make sure you know that for sure. So uh, I just want to talk about a couple of lovely, lovely, lovely assistive devices because um, these are really important. So we have our cane. We got a little uh, our minor with our cane uh, here, and we have our walker character. So it's really important. How do we measure a cane for a patient? This is important. How do we measure a cane for a patient? I'm trying to look through. I'm going to make sure I didn't miss an important point for you guys. I had a couple of notes of things I wanted to make sure I said in the right order. And I got all these lovely papers that I had completely out of order. Uh, I like to blame Steve. Oh, well, I don't have it on here. So how do we measure... Um, Oh, wow, Sarah got it right away. Um, the big thing is, so a cane needs to come up to about the greater trochanter of the femur. So even our image right here is a little bit high, and that's really important because you don't want them to be thrown off balance. You don't want them to be walking with their cane like this on this side, right? You don't want them to be throwing their hips out of alignment. That's really important. Um, and, of course, um, uh, the walker, what's important with the walker? What's really important with walking with a walker? Well... The important thing here is to walk with the affected leg first. So you can see our walker here, and you can see he's walking with his little crooked leg, walking with his affected leg. And that's about the biggest, biggest, biggest thing right there, um, for sure. Sizing crutches. Um, another really, really important one you're likely to see, how do we size crutches? How do we size those lovely crutches? It's really easy to remember. From under the arm, that's right, but how under the arm? And that's right. Um, lots of you guys are typing it in now, and that's right, Mike. Uh, two inches. Or I like to just try to remember about three fingers, two to three fingers, which is about two inches below the armpit. So you're going to stick these lovely three fingers of yours and going to stick them in that patient's armpit. And you're going to make sure those crutches are below that lovely uh, two inches, but two inches below the armpit. That's really, really, really important. These are things you're going to see. Um, as far as communication, very likely you're going to get some questions on this. Um, hearing impaired and visually impaired. The big thing is, especially with hearing impaired, is that you don't yell at your patients. Um, just because your patient is hearing impaired, number one, let me back up a second, just because your patient is old, please don't yell at those old people. Some of those old people are not deaf. I'm getting old. Please don't yell at me. I have a baby face. But in the next five years, if I keep living my life like it is, it ain't going to look this beautiful. Do not yell at me. I'm going to yell back. And that's something you just don't want to do. What do you want to do? The biggest thing is I want to look you. I want to I be um, eye to eye, face level with you. So here I am. Look, here I am. Hey, hey, hi, friend. Right here we are. Here we are. Right? Face level. We're at eye level. And we're going, I'm going to face you when I speak. Uh, and I actually try to enunciate my words. Um, personally, I have a very expressive face, which I'm not sure is a good thing all the time. 
but I'm going to talk to you, and then I'm going to wait, and as Tracy says again, I'm going to wait for you to respond, and that's absolutely right. So we want to be patient, so we're going to talk to them and wait for them to respond. Now what we can do if we want to make sure somebody doesn't hear us, we want to make sure that they hear us is by asking them um, you know, to repeat the re directions back or repeat the teaching back. Um, and that's really, really important to make sure that we have that. Um, visually impaired, what's really, really important, probably the most important thing I think, personally I think, um, for somebody who is blind on, um, uh, and I don't want to give away the answer here, What, what's the Immediately when I say taking care of somebody who's visually impaired, what, what, should, what should your responses, what are the important things to know about taking care of somebody who's visually impaired? There's a, a couple big ones. JoJo has safety. Well, safety is always important because we never want anybody to get hurt. So I agree with you there, but I want to get a little bit more specific. Um, announce yourself. Lots of you guys say that, and that's a very, 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 very important. Um, don't surprise them. Always a good point. Uh, that's those are, these are all really good points. Also for the deaf, um, or you know, somebody who's hard of hearing, that's also important. Um, understanding they're not deaf, that's important. But the big one I was wanting to go for, it looks like um, Christy says it here. The big one is feeding, because um, this is what I actually see a lot on questions. Um, I see a lot of questions on this. So you're likely to see questions about the, or you're likely to, you know, understand or already know about the cane with the red, white cane with the red tip, visually impaired. Make sure that they understand and know or are familiar with their surroundings. Yes, all those things are very true, and I personally believe very understood. But what is really important is making sure that you are feed them in a very specific way, because um, you need to lay out their food. And how do you lay out their food? you're going to lay out their food via the clock method. This is very, 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 very important. And personally, I think it's just cruel if you don't know this. So if you're going to be a nurse um, and you plan on being a nurse, this is something you must, must, must know. Because I think it's just cruel because these people expect it, um, especially for medical providers. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of, I personally believe, cruel if you don't know it because um, they don't know to tell you that. But you want to feed in a clockwise direction. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean you you know, move it in a clockwise direction before you stick it in their mouth? No. What you do is you set the food up um, in a 12 and a, a 3 and a 6 and 9 uh, clock pattern, and then you inform them what food is at every direction. So you say, Mr. Smith, I want to let you know that the mashed potatoes are at 12 o'clock. Oh, I've got my West Virginia slang going on here. The mashed potatoes are at the 12, uh, 12 o'clock. Um, the green beans are at 3 o'clock. You have some roast beef at 6 o'clock, and you have some uh, fruitcake or pudding or whatever the dessert is at 9 o'clock. Make sure you do that same clockwise thing. That's really important for them because that is very, 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 very important. And I'm just going to be honest with you. It personally offends me if somebody doesn't know that because that's really important basic, basic fact. And that's really important for these patients because that's how they eat. Um, so if you're not able to do that for them, um, I feel like you're really uh, doing them a disservice. Just make sure you understand that. And it's likely actually you're going to see um, understanding that clockwise method of how to you know give them food really important um, so <clears throat> we also have uh, next our um, culture so culture 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 is really important and I'm gonna be honest at Picmonic it's something we always try to stay away away from because we make images that are most definitely most definitely um, actually let me back up a quick uh, Jojo asks, um, how would he know the time, 12, 3, 6, and 9? Well, um, what's actually really important is that anybody can learn, and um, what they learn is that the orientation of anything, and they learn the clock method. Um, so they learn 12, 3, 6, and 9, and then learn exactly what a clock looks like. Just because they're not blind doesn't mean they're not as smart as you are, or smarter. So don't take that assumption, and that's something that um, I actually find a lot that is really, really, really um, bothersome sometimes because you need to make sure that you you know you never assume that they don't know because they probably do know and if they don't know they're going to speak up and tell you but these patients have been blind for a long time unless you're dealing with a patient who is newly blind because of an acute condition I mean that scenario that's entirely different but you're likely not to be uh, you're going to be told that if that's the scenario so moving on here to culture 
So culture again, um, I just want to touch on a couple of these just really quick um, and um, just kind of hit on some some high yield points with some culture things. But the big thing is, um, uh, so we have, um, let's see what we have here in our culture section. Um, I'm just going to touch a couple of these. So we've got our Native Americans, um, Native Americans. The big thing is almost all these um, different culture types, they do not do um, direct eye contact. So you should assume that that is normal. Anytime any kind of culture question comes up and they don't make direct eye contact, you should just immediately assume that that's normal and be okay with it. Um, and um, the other thing is most of the cultures like Arab American, um, Mexican American, there's usually... Um, uh, usually someone, maybe somebody else making the decisions in those um, scenarios, and um, it's per also perfectly okay. Anytime you get any kind of culture question, it is very likely that the answer is accept it and move on. Um, do not draw attention, do not question, do not under, do not dive further into why. Um, you see uh, there's a, uh, an old question but a goodie about coining. Um, and coining is, you know, rubbing the coins on, a, on your child's back. That's not child abuse. That's part of their culture, and that is perfectly acceptable, and that is understood. Um, that, but that's also where you would look for those other cues of bruises in multiple stages in other parts of the body. You know, a, a child who doesn't want to speak to you and doesn't want to you know, answer any of your questions, inconsistencies in the story and things like that. Um, those are also really important. Also understand lots of cultures don't like to do organ donation. Um, and uh, lots of other little hot, cold type things as well. But most of them, the big thing here is that they really just avoid contact uh, for sure. Um, so just some quick patient positions. Um, this is a really, really basic fundamental concept, but I just want to talk about this. Uh, we got our T, Trendillenburg here. Um, what's important about the Trendillenburg position? Well, we're going to put the feet in the air. We've got our T, Bird here character, uh, Mr. T, Bird. Um, why do we put the feet up? What type of uh, patient will we put up? What kind of patient do we put the feet up? Well, that's right. Shock, hypovolemia, absolutely right. Any type of hypotension, um, for sure. So we have our supine. We've got our supine spine here. That's on the back. Don't forget that. This is you know basic things you should just know. Um, Fowler's position. We have the low Fowler's, uh, medium Fowler's, high Fowler's position. We get our fowl here. Just remember that that's raising the back up, for sure. Um, and the m number one thing, any patient who's having difficulty breathing, set those patients up. Number one thing you should be doing. Um, we've got the sideline position. Um, this also works for pregnant patients. If you put them on the sideline position to take that pressure off the vena cava. Um, sideline position, Sims position for a beautiful um, enema, Emma uh, patient, also very important. We have our prone prune position, um, which is on the belly, which is something we don't use very often, but sometimes it's seen in surgeries. Um, and then we have our SIMS position here, which is with that knee um, all the way increased up. Now, what you're going to see right here with all of these positions, as you see right here with our SIMS position, is that we've got this knee padded. And that's really, really important because we always pad all the brony promises, promise, prominences. Um, and that's really important um, for sure. So the next thing um, we're going to talk about. Oh, let me, oh, i got a couple questions here. Oh, sorry, just a couple of statements, I guess. Uh, but all you guys are right on all your comments. None of those are definitely wrong. Uh, wow, lots of them just popped in all at once. Oh, Samia so asks if I'm seeing your questions. Well, Samia, so I haven't seen a specific question, but we get lots of responses. So you can always type it again or type it at the end for sure. And we'll get to it. Um, now, this next thing is something you probably, very most likely, I could almost guarantee, going to receive some type of question on types of precautions. Please, 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 please understand this. Please understand what to do for it and see exactly what you need to do. Now, the number one thing is standard precautions. Now, what are standard precautions? Well, you can see right here in our standard precautions, and we kind of cut it off, but you need to put on standard precautions. You need to put on some eyewear, maybe a mask if you need it, maybe a gown, and after the gown, after the gown, then those lovely gloves. gloves. And this is really important also for sterile procedure because um, I just wrote a question about this today, actually, or yesterday. But how do I remember that I put the gloves on after the gown? Well, if I have gloves on, and let's say these gloves are clean, and then I stick them through a sleeve on a gown, second, well, now they're all dirty with all this crud on the gown. So what I want to do is I'm going to put my gown on. Here's my gown. I have this beautiful blue gown on. And then 
I want to put my gloves on over top, and they roll up over top of the gown edges, and that's really, really important. Um, another important thing is to wash in and wash out. We've got it right here in our image. That's super, super, super important. Always uh, discard everything um, inside the room as well. Standard precautions. Now, uh, from that, we have um, uh, contact precautions. Now, contact precautions include um, really the big thing of keeping, um, not touching the patient, or understanding that something on the patient is going to touch you and ride on to another patient. That's really the important thing here. It's, you know, the, these aren't necessarily designed to protect the provider. They're protecting you from transmitting it on to another patient. Um, and that's why we always wear a gown and gloves. We have a gown and gloves character right here. Um, and we may um, assume that we have a patient, may need to give them a private room. Um, and we're always going to put these gown and gloves on to keep those uh, organisms in that room. So somebody who has some uh, C. diff, um, lovely C. diff, or maybe a, a MRSA infection in a wound, we're going to put them on contact precautions. They're going to be in their private room, and the big, big thing is we're going to have contact precautions. You see that little card outside the rooms, you're going to put those gloves on and put the gowns on. Must, must, must do that. Parts of your body rub up against things, and that room is infected. It's really, really important. The next thing is droplet or airborne precautions, and this is things like influenza, um, TB, uh, big uh, viruses like that, we have um, uh, droplet precautions. And um, airborne precautions, anything that you can pretty much just cough and aerosolize, you want to put them in this negative pressure room so that if, if the, the air is being sucked from the outside in so that none of those organisms are going from the outside out. Of course, they need to be in a private room, but um, you know they're going to have this negative pressure air for like TB, measles, varicella, things like that. It's really, really important. Um, any patient, uh, oh, and Mar Marcella actually says a really important um, is that you have an N95 uh, mask, and that's really, really important. You're probably going to be fitted with an N95 mask if you haven't been already, um, for sure. So uh, Jojo asks if a patient with MRSA can go outside a private room. Absolutely. So what we do then, um, if they go outside of a room, a patient with contact precautions, even airborne precautions, well, what are we going to do then? Does everyone in the hospital have to put on a mask? No. What happens then is we cover up that patient with MRSA in a wound. We cover up the wound, and we put a blanket over the bed, and those patients can move outside the room. Um, a patient with TB, perhaps, would wear an N95 mask themselves. So we would keep that mask on them at all times while we're transporting that patient. And that's really, really what is important. It doesn't mean, so the difference is, if you enter the room, you wear protective precaution. When you take a patient out of the room, then the patient wears precaution. But a patient doesn't need, we need to wear precautions inside their own room. And that's really, really, um, really, really important. Um, Gregory asked, why does a man have three legs? I guess I don't... Oh, um, uh, oh shoot, I can't remember, um, to be honest. It's a, um, it's a part of the Picmonic. It's a story in this Picmonic, and I can't remember exactly um, why it says it. But you can go to Picmonic.com, and you can look up drop, Droplet Airboard Precautions, and definitely, definitely, definitely see that for sure. Uh, but, but sure. But Samia asks, how long are the room can they go? They can go as far as they want, as long as they have the proper precautions. Um, they can't go outside and smoke a cigarette, but that's not the kind of things we allow. But they can be transported to x-ray, transported to CT scan, things like that for tests and procedures and surgery. So another quick concept, because we're, um, we're almost done here, is um, wound healing. And this is really important, definitely, definitely important, wound healing. Now, um, we need to understand the Braden scale. Uh, skin integrity and ulcers. Now, all these types of things are important um, and understand the stages of wound healing um, and then really just understanding like surgical devices and um, uh, for sure. Oh, actually, um, let me just go back here. So, um, the uh, droplet precautions is um, uh, the reason there are three feet uh, is because there's three, you need to be three feet from the patient. Uh, three feet from the patient. Otherwise, you may be sprayed with these beautiful droplets. Um, that's why there's three feet uh, in that particular question. So that's your answer. So um, I usually don't like to jump back, but Steve clarified my answer there and got me, kept me on speed. So uh, wound healing, um, big thing here. We're just going to go over a couple different things on wound healing. This is all really, really important stuff. So we have our little pressure cookers for our pressure cooker ulcer volcanoes for pressure ulcers. And everything pretty much 
um, the Braden scale, impaired skin integrity, everything comes back to pressure ulcers. Pressure ulcers, right? So you need to know the stages of pressure ulcers, and this is we have a whole picmonic just on the types and the stages of pressure ulcers. So just understand that any type of reddening right away. No, we don't have it. We don't have the image in here, but um, any type of reddening right away, reddening on the skin is a stage one pressure ulcer, and that's really really important. Um, and then I just like to always remember that a stage four pressure ulcer is pretty much when there's muscle and bone exposed. So just reddening, you know, reddening skin is a stage one, right? You know, you can push the skin. It's not just red because it's red, but you, it's red because of pressure, right? That's a stage one. And then a stage four is muscle, bone, exposed. It's easily how you can tell a stage four. So here we got our inside of our picmonic. We actually have all the different layers of the skin, all the details for types of pressure ulcers. So it's definitely one um, you should go and review for sure. Um, another thing um, is just you know, interventions for impaired skin integrity. So a patient who has impaired skin integrity, what's really important for those patients? What do we want to do for a patient who has a risk for impaired skin integrity or currently has impaired skin integrity? What's important? So they have a wound, basically. What's really important? Lots of you guys immediately, you know, Samia says uh, repositioning. Very, very, very important. Q to our turns. You must have that Q to our turns, and these patients must, must, must stay dry. Now I'm talking like I'm not talking like you know Tempe, Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, where I'm at located dry, but it needs to be dry. Meaning if they have soiled linens or they have a leaky catheter or they don't have a catheter and they're urinating on themselves, they must be changed and dried and cleaned all at all times. It's always going to cause skin breakdown. And the other thing Victoria points out, which is good, is definitely a high protein, uh, more high calorie diet that's really, really important for sure. Definitely the protein um, to increase that collagen and help them get this uh, skin, uh, get the skin built back up. But also, it's also really important to pad bony prominences. So any kind of the heels, the hips, the sides, and as you move these people in between the knees, I mean, even when I sleep, I have a nice, lovely little pillow in between my knees. Not because I have a break risk for skin breakdown, but because it's bony prominences. I got gnarly, gnarly knees. My gnarly knees are ridiculous, but I don't want my gnarly knees to rub up against each other. I want to have these nice, beautiful comfy knees with this pillow in between, and that's exactly what you need to think about. You put a patient in the Sims position, you better be putting a pillow underneath that knee, but also for any patient you put on their side that's really, really, really important. Now, um, a couple other things. We actually have a really great um, picmonic. I'm, uh, the, when we record this lecture, which we record these later on, um, I'm going to put this um, the image from our picmonic in here because it's a really great one. We have the types of wound drainage devices um, so that you're able to actually go in and see like a Jackson Pratt drain um, and understanding how to empty that and that it suck, you know, uses suction to keep the, to pull out of the wound for sure. Um, that's really important. Now, another thing, um, you know, types of wound handing, primary intention, secondary intentions, tertiary intention. We've got another beautiful picmonic for that. You can go in and view as well. And the last thing is really just um, using rice for treating soft tissue injuries. What is rice? I mean, do we, you know, do we stick it into rice? Do we stick their arm in rice? When I dropped my phone one time, I stuck it in some ice. And I waited like four days until the rice sucked all that fluid out, and then I pulled it out, and it was working. And I was like, magic, I should go to nursing school, right? No, absolutely wrong. Rice stands for exactly what you guys are saying. The big thing is rest any type of injured limb. Rest it. And then we want to put ice on it uh, for in, to decrease inflammation. So ice, then we want uh, to put compression on it. Um, and I'm not talking like a tourniquet style compression. We're talking about a light compression. And number one out of all this, most important, if I have a swelled up hand, I absolutely must put that hand way up in the air. Because if that hand's way up in the air, that lymphatics are going to drain with gravity and it's going to decrease edema. Most of the edema is leaking out from the veins into the interstitial fluid, and what's going to carry that away? The lymphatic system. The lymphatic system works by what? It works by muscles 
and gravity. It does not work with veins. So you must, must, must use gravity. You must elevate, 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 elevate. Don't forget that. That's really, really, really important. Um, that's probably the most important, to be honest. But the big thing is rest, um, ice. Um, another thing really important with wounds um, or like a sore muscle, sometimes we teach alternating cold and hot therapy or warm therapy. What's really important if we're using any time a heating pad or, or warm compresses, what is important with those? Or cold compresses as well. What's, it, what's the important teaching point? It's actually a really high yield question. I should put this in here. You guys know this. Come on. I know you know it. The big thing here is, that's right, limit the amount of time it's on there and don't put it right on the skin. If you've got this beautiful heating pad, you must put something in between that beautiful heating pad and your skin so it doesn't burn your skin off. Or if you have a bag of ice, you're not just going to throw a giant block of ice on the skin. You're going to put that block of ice up against something to insulate it so that it can then, you know, thermally go through that and not actually freeze the skin. So it'll freeze that intermediary device or it'll burn that intermediary device. And that's really, really important. And of course, we never want to put anything more than about 20 minutes. And that's about right. A lot of you guys type that in for sure. And it's really, really, really important. 20 minutes uh, in between. You want to sometimes alternate heat and cold. That's often therapy that we actually prescribe. Uh, but definitely, definitely, definitely important. Um, so uh, what's really, really important is that you understand all of these points and all of these topics we have here on the screen are all in Picmonics that you can easily review inside of our Picmonic learning system. You can go to Picmonic.com and sign up and get uh, access to see these and all of our wonderful characters and a lovely voice to help you remember all of them. It's not my voice on all of them, but there's a few of them. You'll see my lovely voice, uh, but you're not going to see my wonderful face because that's where you see these here in the webinar. Um, but lots of you guys uh, have lots of questions, of course, um, on asking about um, how are you going to see these again. Um, we do recorded webinars uh, very often, and we publish them on our YouTube channel. You can go to youtube.com and look for Picmonic video. Um, you, most importantly, to get everything we went over, go to picmonic.com and just check out our Picmonic learning system. Um, go to picmonic.com, sign up for an account, and search and see all these Picmonic topics. Everything we went over is times 10 inside of our Picmonic.com uh, system. So you just go to Picmonic.com and sign up, and you'll see all of this in here. If you want to see just my beautiful face on a webinar, well, then you're probably going to have to go to like YouTube or um, uh, YouTube and see Picmonic video, and you'll see a lot of these in here. Um, this particular webinar won't be available usually for about a week. So if you're up against a particular uh, time break, um, I don't. I'm not going to have it. But if you have any questions now, now is a great time. Something we didn't get to and I can get to really quick. You can type it into the question box right away. Um, and I will see if I can get to your questions and help you out. Um, let's see what we have here. Oh, Tracy says, have a great holiday, Kendall. Well, thanks, Tracy. I'm going to go see my mother in Texas. And um, then after that, I am going to a remote location where no one will find me in Picmonic Land or Nursing World or anything to the like. And I will be gone for five whole days. And that leads into my next question of um, Sarah asks, how long to my next webinar? Well, what you'll realize, guys, is that we do tons of free webinars and we have no more schedule. Well, that's because I'm taking a vacation because I'm going to this remote location that no one knows about. And they hope that I come back. But um, we'll be back in January with lots more live webinars. Um, but we're also hopefully hoping to have our uh, finalized series of a recorded webinars um, up for you. So you have all of the beautiful ones recorded with my lovely face and all the weird questions and all the really corny jokes that are all there for you for sure. Let's see what we have here. Uh, Jana says, thanks. Great webinar. Well, you're welcome, Jana. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Okay, Daniel has a question here really quick. Um, I've gotten a question. I have gotten a question that saying that if a false negative is good for TB test. The negative versus positive, positive in TB. I'm not actually sure of your question, but let's talk about it. Um, so there is 
what makes a positive TB test? Well, you get a, a, T, a tuberculin skin test, which is a, a intradermal injection, right? So you get this intradermal injection of TB, tuberculin, weakened, um, and it's injected. And once it's injected, you have 48 to 72 hours, and we're waiting on this type 4 sensitivity reaction. Your body is waiting on a type 4 sensitivity reaction. Now, there's a couple of scenarios that are going to happen here. Number one, you've been exposed to DB, and you're going to mount a response to that. Hey, I recognize that, and I'm going to make a response, and I'm going to kill it, your body says. Or, or, you've been immunized by the BCG vaccine, usually only from patients who come and they've immigrated to the United States, because we don't give it in the U.S., or uh, maybe much older patients who receive the BCG vaccine. Not a common scenario in, in the NCLEX. But they would also mount a positive response because they've the BCG vaccine is actually a live vaccine. Your body it mounts immune response and right away. It's going to get this type four sensitivity reaction. Um, or um, you have no reaction. You have less than a five uh, or less than a ten millimeter induration. Or if you're a high risk or you're immunocompromised, um, your test is essentially positive at uh, five millimeters. Now. Once we have those, so if you're immunocompromised, you're a positive of five millimeters, you're positive, we move forward. If you have a BCG vaccine, you're positive, we move forward, because we need to test you further. Or if you just have a 10 millimeter, greater than 10 millimeter in duration, we move forward. And what happens, what does it mean when we move forward? Well, we go to the next step, and the next step is to do a chest x-ray. Because what we know about TB is that it's really, really cheap to do this TB test on everyone. I have to get one every year, it annoys me to death. but um, you know, I come back negative. But if I came back positive, where is TB? Almost always, 99.999% of the time, it's in the lungs. So it's spread by, uh, you know, it's aerosolized. It's, you know, it's something we have to do, air, you know, airborne precautions from. So it's in the lungs, remember that. So when we do this chest x-ray, it's going to have, you're going to have these nodules in your lung or a gong complex or, um, you know, you're going to see these gong complexes in your lungs and it's, pathognomonic TB. It's like, whoa, this guy has a real TB infection. If not, you're negative and you go on down the road. So you have a false negative test and that's where you really get that. So you have a you know, false negative test. TB tests aren't perfect and that's where we should really understand. I hope that answered your question, uh, Daniel. Uh, Samia asks a question of the order the meds should be given and I don't know what kind of meds you're talking about. So, um, Clarissa asks about um, when reporting abuse, do we, as nurses, report it to authorities or charge nurses? And she reports it. Well, that really depends on your hospital policy. But what I can tell you on the NCLEX is that you report it to the authorities. That's going to be your answer. The answer on the NCLEX is not going to be, a, it's going to be reported to child services, child protective services or the government authority, whatever it says right there. It's not going to be an internal mechanism on an NCLEX style test. But um, your hospital policy may be to report it to the charge nurse, and that's fine. Remember, um, in NCLEX world, we have everything at our disposal in NCLEX world. In the NCLEX world, I've got a neurologist sitting right here. I've got an, a cardiologist sitting right here. I've got my doctor sitting right here. We know that never happens in real life. I've got somebody else sitting right here, an infectious disease guy. I've got the pharmacist sitting right here across me. They're all just right here. I can ask them any question. They jump in in any second. And that's what you should think about this perfect world. Don't think about what we actually do in your facility because that will always mess you up. But the real answer is you report it to the, um, to the uh, you know, government agency that's tracking in the United States for sure. Oh, Sarah asks... Uh, Hello from Texas and San Antonio. Come on down. Actually, Sarah, next year for um, let's see, where am I? I'm going to be in San Antonio next year for a convention. I'm not sure which one. I think it's uh, the Texas Association of Vocational Nursing Educators next year. Actually, I think I'm speaking at that convention next year. I'm pretty sure it's going to be in San Antonio for sure. So definitely. Um. Uh, do, do, do. So Marcel has another question about TB. Um, so maybe TB is a hot topic lately. I don't know. But um, the big thing is uh, she had a question about is 5 millimeters in duration negative or positive? Well, this is really important because you've got to read the stem of your question. 5 millimeter in duration is only positive in two types of patients, a patient who is high risk or a patient who has a 
compromised immune system. So a patient with HIV, a patient on chronic immunosuppressive therapy, um, a patient with a low T cell. Those are patients who have a that's a positive test net level. If they have, if I have a five millimeter induration, I'm fine. That's a negative test. Tell them to have a nice day. You read it as negative and you follow up next year. No further indications needed. Hmm. Liz, I don't really understand your question for sure, but Chrissy says, uh, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays and all, she typed in a whole bunch of stuff, but um, I'll see you next year too, Christy. Uh, but da -da -da, good luck, Sarah. She's taking her Jan NCLEX on January 25th. Um, let's see here. I just got a couple more minutes. I look like lots of questions are pouring in. Oh, boy. Um, Elenez, I can't even say this. Elenez? Elenez, that's how you say it. Um, Asked we'll be in Florida. Well, we're going to be in Florida next, actually in March for the, um, National Student Nursing Association Convention in Orlando, Florida. So if you are a student nurse, you should come to the NSNA in March and see us there because we'll be there. The whole Picmonic team will be there. Well, not the whole Picmonic team, but there will be like four or five of us for sure. Um, so Liz asks, if you are anergic, um, can you amount a response? And can you actually mount a response? Um, so you mean, I mean, if you're anergic, that would mean same thing would be like immunocompromised. I think you're just uh, maybe caught on some uh, terminology here. But if you're anergic, then you can't mount any type of immuno responses for sure. So the answer would be no. I mean, um, any kind of anybody who's immunocompromised, um, that's those people in TB are positive at five millimeters in duration. Now, it is possible that a patient who has severely immunocompromised, maybe they have a, they're severely late stage HIV and for some reason you don't realize they're almost dead and um, you do a TB test on them. If you did a TB test on them, they're not going to mount any response. But those types of scenarios you're not going to get on your NCLEX. You're not going to get it uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, Arlene asks if you can be allergic to the TB test. You know, I'm sure you can, um, but it's pretty, um, it's just like the um, uh, flu shot. You could be allergic to the flu shot, but keep in mind, um, if you're allergic to it, you're going to amount immediate response, a type 1 sensitivity reaction. Um, the TB test itself is only read till 48 to 72 hours, and that's a type 4 sensitivity uh, reaction. That's a type 4 sensitivity. That's a delayed response. So that's not going to be immediate. If you're allergic to it right away, you're going to get a rash immediately. You're going to start breaking out. You are allergic reaction um, and even severe in subsequent tests. But um, if, you, you know, if you're not allergic to it, you, you we're looking for the type 4 sensitivity reaction, which is going to be that delayed hypersensitivity reaction. So today I was very nice and I answered everyone's questions. So there shouldn't be any other questions. But if you have one, you can always reach out to us at feedback at picmonic.com. Um, we're here for you if you need us. You can always reach out to us. I know lots of you guys are getting ready or for your NCLEX. Um, there's hundreds of people in here today and um, so many of you. Um, if you have any other questions, you can reach out to us at feedback at picmonic. Otherwise, you can always check us out on our YouTube channel at uh, Picmonic.com, search us Picmonic video, and always at Picmonic.com, sign up for an account, check us out, use us, it's going to help you. Have a great night, have a happy holidays, and I won't see you guys until next year live because I'm taking a vacation. Have a good night, and good luck studying.